Uh, how many of you have got New Year's resolutions? Okay, who's got a resolution? Come and be honest now. I won't call you out on it next week. It's okay. Do you have a resolution? Do you have something you want to do this year? I'm going to do this or that. A lot of people have New Year's resolutions, but uh, it's 2020, and, and today I want to I speak to you about how to pack for the year, okay? So how do you pack for 2020? We're not uh, going anywhere, but um, we're, we're, we're speaking about packing for the new year, and just because I, I, um, I, I, I thought rather than just speak about it, I, I brought my suitcase along. So uh, I'm ready for 2020. I'm packed up and ready to go. Uh, I've, I've got my suitcase here, and it, it, it is packed. It is packed. I'll show you what's in here in a minute. But fact of the matter is, I'm, I'm, I'm packed for the year. I've, uh, I've, I've, I've packed a suitcase for the year. It's got all kinds of things in there, all kinds of things that we need for the new year, because we're all going on a journey, aren't we? There's a year ahead of us. There's some things that's going to happen. You've got some things ready. You've got some resolutions down, okay? How many of you have already broken a New Year's resolution? <laughs> Okay, come on, let's be honest, okay? Who's totally given up on New Year's resolutions? Okay, there we go, okay. So fact of the matter is, whether you have some resolutions, no resolutions, a lot of resolutions, broken resolutions, or still resolutions that are perfectly intact, the, whether you have re resolutions or no resolutions, we all have expectations. We all have hope. We're all hoping for something. We all have something in this year that we say, I'm, I'm expecting this to happen, or I'm hoping this would happen. I'm hoping this would change. I'm hoping this would be different. Is there anybody that wants something to be different this year than what it was last year? Something that you're going, I'm hoping that won't be the same. I'm hoping that will change. I'm hoping this will be better. If, if, if your New Year's resolution has something to do with how much you've eaten between Christmas and New Year's, I have good news. Well, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year, let me tell you something. It's not what you eat between Christmas and New Year's that makes you fat. It's what, it's what you eat between New Year's and Christmas that makes you fat. Think about that a little bit, okay? Just, just mull on that. Give it a moment. Fact of the matter is that we all have hopes, but some of us have fears. And I don't know about you, but there are some things that I fear for the year ahead. There are things that when I think about it, I'm going, if this keeps going the way it's been going, I don't think I can keep going. If this keeps happening the way, if, if this year is like last year, I can't do it. And maybe you, you don't just have expectations, maybe you've got some fear. But the fact of the matter is, as we are here today, each and every one of us, we've packed. We've got some things in there which we've set aside and we've said, this is, this is my resolutions. These are my expectations. And here I've got, I've got what I've packed for 2020 and I've got several different things that I've set aside. Okay, don't worry about it. It's not that bad. It's okay. It's I've got some necessary toiletries. I, I, I thought that it might be cold at some point in the year, so, so I've, 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 I've got a rain jacket. Because I don't know about you, regardless of how well-intentioned you are about 2020, regardless of uh, how many good ideas you have for the year ahead, the fact of the matter is that I can guarantee you that there's going to be a couple of storms. It, it doesn't matter if, if, if you're hoping for the best, the reality is some of us are going to go through some storms in the course of the year to come. And we've got to expect that. We've got to be ready for those things to happen. I, 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 I brought some trainers. I brought some tennis shoes along. Why? Because we all have resolutions about our waistlines in, in the new. No? Just me? Okay, just me. Cly Clyde is keeping to his New Year's resolution. I've got good news. There's sunny days ahead, okay? We need some sunblock, right? There's going to be some good times. We're going to have some fun. There's going to be some great things. And, um, you know, maybe you're looking at the new year and you're wondering if you're going to manage to sleep. This is a uh, sleep aid, melatonin. Maybe you, you feel like you've been struggling to find rest. Maybe you're thinking and you're saying, I hope this year I find some rest. Maybe you're concerned about some things. Got some Advil in here. Maybe you're going, you know what, there's some pain of the past. What does your suitcase for 2020 look like? What have you packed for the year ahead? What have you set aside and said, for 2020, this is what I'm taking with me? 
This is the sum total of my fears, the sum total of my hopes, the sum total of my resolutions, and the sum total of my expectations. What have you set aside and said, this is my care? There's a moment when the nation Israel didn't go into a new year per se, but they certainly went into a new season, a, a radically new season, a season that they, they, they didn't realize was going to come. In fact, they were waiting for it for 400 years, and I'll, I'll give you a bit of context over the season, but they, they packed. In fact, they didn't pack their bags. God packed it for them. And I'm going to tell you the story about the day God packed Israel's bags. The day he said that the season that lies ahead of you is so important, it's so significant, it's it's so grand that that I'm not gonna even I'm not even gonna expect of you to pack your bag. I'm gonna pack your bag for you. But the, that moment has a run-up of several hundred years. It starts off in Genesis chapter 12. God comes to a guy called Abraham. He calls him from Ur and the Chaldeans, and he, and, he, and he calls him to a place that he will show him. And he says, I'm going to give you this land, and I'm going to make you a great nation. And then, then, then Abraham goes to this land, and, and actually when he gets there, he doesn't get the land, and he only has a, a couple of kids. He doesn't have a great nation yet. But he believes God's promise, and then a couple of generations passes on, and, 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 and this, um, you know, eventually three generations later, a guy called Joseph is born, and, and Joseph is hated by his brothers, sold into slavery. He ends up in Egypt. It's a long story what happens there, but through a, through a series of events, he ends up in, second in charge of all of Egypt. Um, a famine then breaks out amongst the, the three generation of the sons of Abraham that's been in the promised land, and, and they end up coming to Egypt to come find some food, and they end up finding more than food. They find their brother, and not only does he give them food, but he invites the whole family over, and the whole family comes to Egypt, and they're treated like royalty in Egypt, and, and it's, it's amazing. By, by the end of the book of Genesis, we find the end of the life of Joseph, and, and Joseph dies, and he says his one desire is to be buried back in the land that was promised, because this was God's promise. This was God saying, this is the place, this is the nation, this is what I'm going to do, and, he, and he, his one desire is to, is to be buried back there. But then between the book of Genesis and the, the book of Exodus, 400 years pass. And in those 400 years, the Israelites, this, this nation of God, not only grows from a couple hundred people to several million people, but, but this nation actually grows from, goes from being welcomed in Egypt to being slaves in Egypt. And then the book of Exodus tells us the story of how they're oppressed as slaves. So for 400 years, this nation that has now developed were waiting for the promise of God, not only to become a nation, but to live in the land that God has promised them. And for 400 years, they, they, would, they would come into every year with great hopes and expectations, but more of what they would experience in that year is fear and challenge. And year after year, it wouldn't quite work out the way they hoped it would, and it would be a disappointing year after a disappointing year. And eventually, a guy that gets born into this generation, into this nation called Moses, he just can't take it anymore. And around the age of 40, he, 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 ends up, he ends up taking one of these slave drivers that's driving his nation, God's nation, God's chosen people, and he ends up killing him, and then he runs away for 40 years. And after 40 years in the desert, at the age of around 80, God calls him with a burning bush. You've heard the story. Moses comes back to the people of God, and, and, and he goes up to the Pharaoh, and he says, let my people go. God is calling my people out once more. He wants to take them to the promised land. And Pharaoh says, my best laborers, my slaves, my property, why would I ever do that? And Moses says, well, I want to tell you, if you don't, I'm going to warn you. And you know the story, 10 plagues transpire. The last of the 10 plagues is the death of the firstborn. And after every one of the plagues, Pharaoh says, no, the Egyptian says, no, it's never going to happen. We're never going to let you go. And suddenly in the 10th plague, it's, it, they wake up that morning and every firstborn in the nation is dead. Animal, child, everyone except for the people of Israel. And it's at this moment that we pick up the story in Exodus chapter 12, verse 31, when this happens. And it says, then he called, Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron by night and said, rise, go out from my people. Go out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. 
And then it gets interesting. Also take with you your flocks and your herds, as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. And the Egyptians, uh, the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land ha- in haste, for they said, we shall all be dead. The fear of God has come upon them. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, having their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes on their shoulders. Now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, and they had asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold, and of clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so they granted them what they requested. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. God backed the bags of the Jews on their way out of Egypt. God prepared them. Now, just for a moment, imagine the absurdity of this. A nation that was slaves in Egypt, they were nothing, they were beaten, they did manual labor. In fact, they didn't even have ownership of themselves. They were owned by another, as strange as that would be. So any Any profit they would make, any pay they would receive would go to their master, not to them, because they had no rights. Suddenly plunder the most powerful nation in the world through the the hand of God, and God gives them favor, and these people give them their silver, their gold. God packs them a bag for the journey. He redeems hundreds of years of slavery in a moment, and he says, here you go, grab this, go to the promised land that I have prepared for you. He sets them up for what lies ahead. My prayer for you in this year is that you would allow God to pack you a bag of expectation. I pray that God will come and journey with you. He would come and prepare you. He would come and ready you. He would come and speak into your heart. He would come and ready you for some of the storms that he knows is on your way. But more than that, he would come and set a God-sized expectation in your heart, one that would lead you to pray about the great things God has in mind for you, more than just expecting and resolving to do all kinds of things in yourself. What if our expectation was of one greater than ourselves for the year ahead? If there's one thing that I've learned about Moses' story, Moses wanted to deliver his people and all he got was running away like a nobody. And, but then he came back 40 years later on the command of God and he, he let his nation go. And the difference was the one he did out of a resolution within himself and the other one he did out of the command of God. What is going to drive 2020 in your life? Are you going to live 2020 according to the resolutions in your own hearts and the trying harder by yourself, or are you going to allow God to pack you a bag? Get you ready. There's different types of packers in this world. Have you noticed? Yes? No? Okay. I can see some husbands and wives. It's a touchy issue. It's okay. I'll, I won't personify it in any way. I'm just saying in general. You find some of those detail people, they're normally packed, I don't know, two, three, four weeks before a trip. You know, they've got everything ready, everything's in place, the suitcase is packed. And then you've got the non-detail people, they hate packing. They hate packing. Nothing's worse than packing because what you've got to put things in there. Now, what happens with the non-detail people, if you've ever seen a detail person pack, they have everything, but everything fits in a neat little suitcase. And then you have those who hate packing, and have you noticed that they can't pack into anything small? They're like, what is the biggest possible suitcase and the most possible weight that I can get? Because, oh, I might need this too. No, 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 okay, this is too personal. This is, we're moving on. We're moving right along. I, I'm not looking at anybody. I'm, I'm hypothetically describing. <laughs> I've heard, I've heard other people, my wife, there's other people, that I've, I've heard these stories told, they, it's they and them somebody. What does your 2020 bag look like? Maybe you haven't given this another thought until this moment to think, what are those fears and expectations that you're carrying? What are the things that, 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 that you've put upon yourself to change, and what are the things where you need to trust God in the time ahead. 
There's an interesting scripture that I'm going to discipline myself not to speak about today. And I'll tell you why I'm not going to speak about it today, because I'm going to speak about it next week. It's in Matthew chapter 6, and it's um, verse 22 to 23, and it's, it's Jesus that makes his statements. It's one of my, I have many favorite statements that Jesus makes, but this is definitely one of my favorites. He says this, he says, the lamp of the body is the eye. If the eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great then is that darkness? Now, I know that this is a very poetic, strange little saying, and if I said that without quoting Jesus, you would probably look at me strange, right? But when Jesus says it, we all go, wow, I'm sure that's deep and profound and powerful. I just have no idea what it means, okay? (laughs) It's okay. It is deep and profound and powerful, and you might not have any idea of what it means, but essentially what Jesus is saying is he's saying that your life goes where your eyes go. And how it links to what I'm saying today is that your life goes where your expectation goes, and your expectation is creating the life you are living. And if we can change your eyes, if you can change it what you're looking at, you'll change the way you live. And that's all I'm going to say right now, okay? Because next week, we've got a Vision Sunday at Fives Off City Church, and we're going to be gathering at 800 Congress. Somebody's having a wedding here. Bless them. Uh, They can have the building, and I hope they have a fantastic wedding. But that means 512 is meeting at 800 Congress. Eighth in Congress, okay, where we had our birthday party. That's where we are next week. There's lots of parking all around. But next week, we're going to meet there. And we're not just going to meet there. We're going to meet there for a vision Sunday. We're going to speak about the vision of Five Top City Church. Why do we exist? Where are we going as a church? What are some of those hopes? What are some of those expectations? What is the part that God has given you as a part of this church? Why are some of you driving down here to go to church? What is all this for? What are we hoping to accomplish? How are we going to reach a city? And what is the part in this great puzzle, in this great picture of God that He has set out for you to fill? And I'm trusting God that you will find some of that. So, so you can miss a Sunday or two this year, but don't miss next Sunday, okay? Um, we're going to speak about this exact thing. How, how is it that we are looking? Because our expectations are created. Our expectations are forming something in our lives. What it is that you expect is forming something in your life. There's this, this great story about a, a shoe company in, in England that sends, a, that, that sends one of their shoe salesmen, one of their representatives to the Congo. And uh, he travels by ships, and it's in the days of telegrams. And after a, a month or two, they don't hear anything back from him. So they fear the worst. They assume their shoe salesman hasn't made it all the way to the Congo. So they send a replacement shoe salesman to the Congo, okay, to, to follow him up. But obviously, the replacement shoe salesman doesn't even know whether or not the other guy has made it. He gets on the ship. He's on his way to the Congo. Um, and just about a week after he left, the company receives a telegram back from the shoe salesman that, that they sent first that's now arrived in Congo. And he sends the telegram back. He says, uh, nobody wears shoes here, no market possible. And, uh, and he says he's on his way back. And they go, well, you know, okay, the poor other guy's still heading to the Congo and clearly there's no market possible. They wait a month later. By this time, the first guy is almost back to London and they receive a telegram from the second guy that's arrived there. He sends a telegram. He says, nobody wears shoes here. Great market potential. (laughs) He's a salesman, clearly, right? Okay, but the fact of the matter is their perspective determined their, their, their embrace of this opportunity. The one saw a challenge and the other saw an opportunity. Did anything change in the Congo in the space of those couple of weeks? Nothing changed. What changed was their ex- expectation. And, and, and Al said something today. He said, he said, you'll never make a difference in the kingdom unless you step out of your comfort zone. And I want to tell you, I, I, I feel like that's God for us right now. Now, that's God that's speaking to us right now as a congregation saying, hey, uh, there, there are going to be challenges. There are going to be things that you might not be comfortable with. There are going to be stepping out of your comfort zone. But I feel like God's challenging us into more. He's challenging us into new. And our perspective is going to determine whether we embrace that or we don't. There's a challenge to step out of your comfort zone, to step out of just the same old, same old, into something new, into something greater, into something God for you. If God could pack a bag for you for 2020, what would it be? 
If he was sending you on this journey, what would, would be the things, the, the fears, the expectations, the resolutions that he would put in there? What's his desire for you in this year to come? What he, what's he stirring in your heart and saying, this is what I long for you to do? See, the same thing that happened to these two salesmen when, when Israel eventually gets to the border of the promised land under the leadership of Moses. Uh, Pharaoh lets them go. <laughs> they um, make a turn by Mount Sinai where, where they actually uh, receive the law. And then um, they arrive at the, the borders of the promised land. And when they arrive at the borders of the promised land, what happens is that, that God speaks to Moses and he sends out these 12 spies. He sends out these 12 individuals and he says, listen, why don't you guys go and just have a look at this promised land, this space. What has happened in the 400 years while we were in Egypt in the space that God has promised us? And what happens is the first bunch of spies, the, the first 10 of the 12, when, when the 12 comes back, this is their report. They, they say in Numbers chapter 13, verse 32 to 33, they gave the children of Israel a bad report. The land which they had spied, uh, about the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies in the land that, that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in there were are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants, thanks buddy, the descendants of Anak that's come from giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sights, and so we were in there. So they come back and they say, no market possible. This is a terrible place. There's, there, there's giants there. We'll never, we don't have an army that can conquer this land. The obstacle that lies ahead in the year before is so great, we'll never do it. Why could I live with an expectation that this year would be any better than last year? What would suddenly change? And maybe, maybe you've already experienced the despair and hopelessness that comes with same old, same old. Maybe you've already experienced that relationship that you said this year the relationship is going to be different and then the same things happened and the same result transpired. And you've already said, you know what, there's no way this is going to change. Ten spies come back, and that's their feedback. They're like, we don't have the army. We don't have, we haven't packed the stuff we need to make this happen. We don't, we don't have the stuff. See, but that's not the only report that the children of Israel receive in that moment. Because, because Joshua and Caleb comes back, and, 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 and Caleb actually, the people are complaining about how did God bring us out here to die? And then it says in a couple of verses later, Caleb says, then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession for we are well able to overcome it. And Caleb goes on and if you read the rest of it, he speaks about what God has placed in his heart and that is God's promise. See, God promised this land. Now, now you all know how this story transpires, right? The, the Israelites believe the 10 spies and for 40 years an entire generation dies off in the desert. I mean, just, just for a moment, think about this, okay? You were slaves in Egypt, okay? You were slaves, you had nothing. God comes, he does miracles. I mean, I'm talking catalytic, big stuff that he does to change the hearts of the most powerful nation in the world. By the time he's done with them, they give you their silver and gold and say, just go. Then you get stuck. There's this little part of the story I left out. They get stuck in the red, by the Red Sea and then God parts the waters. They walk through. He kills the entire Egyptian army in the process. You get out of that on the other side and out of that, then God appears in person on a mountain. You arrive at the borders of the promised land that he promised to your generations four, 500 years before. And you say, oh, we'll never do it. We can't do it. We're not strong enough. We don't have the stuff. I mean, really? I mean, is that really what happens here? And then for 40 years, that entire generation dies off. God just says, okay, if you don't believe me, you can hang about for 40 years in the desert, 40 years in the desert, a whole bunch of miracles happen. And then comes the Joshua generation. They end up taking the promised land. Not by might nor by power, nor by their ability, nor by what they packed, but by trusting God and God doing the miracles. There are some things in this year that God has prepared for you which you can't do. And that's the whole point. 
There are some dreams and some desires and some, some things in the heart of God which is bigger than your own ability, and that's the whole plan, is we are not supposed to resolve our lives into the lives we want. I hope I let somebody off the hook there. But we're supposed to trust a God that is bigger than us. Why is it that America is so prayerless? Have you noticed? People don't really pray. I mean, how many people do you know that really prays and expect something to happen? I mean, we tell one another, oh, I'll pray for you. We, we say it because it's something to say. And some of us sometimes say grace because it's something we do before we eat. But, but other than praying before you eat, how much time do you really spend in prayer? I mean, I, I, if, if we just did a comparison, if you just for a week wrote down how much time you spend worrying about things, versus how much time you spend praying, I, I, I don't think it'll be a, a great tally. Why don't we pray? We, we don't pray because we expect everything of ourselves. We, we've lost our expectation of God. We've lost our expectation of saying, you know what, I don't have what it takes. Those, that is a great challenge. There are some hard things ahead, but God God has promised. God is able. God has done it before and he will do it again. But God, and that drives you to pray. That drives you to, to trust God more than what you trust yourself. In 2 Corinthians, Paul makes this statement. You've heard it a thousand times. You've seen it on a bumper sticker and you probably wrote it down somewhere and you might even have quoted it. We live by faith, not by sight. That's a great statement if you do it. But it is absolutely useless as a platitude. It has no value as a statement if you don't live it. Are you living by faith in response to what God is saying, or are you simply living in response to what you are seeing? Anybody can live according to sight, according to challenge, according to difficulty, according to resolution. Anybody can get on the scale and feel like they need to lose some weight. Why do we always come back to these? It's either food examples or it's we, it's us. We're, we always come back to these. <laughs> Karen's getting me back for my <laughs> hypothetical examples earlier. Someone. Someone. Are we really walking by faith? Are we really walking in response to God? See, when you, when you expect for the here ahead, is it sight or faith? Is it what makes logical sense? Or have you taken the time to just say, hey, God, what is on your heart for this year? Have you taken a moment to, to, to maybe ask that question and say, what have I packed in my bag because of what I've seen? Are you saying, no, you know what? I'm not going to pack my bag of expectation this year just based on what I've seen and what makes logical sense. I'm going to pack my bag of expectation based on what God is saying. I'm going to respond to his word. I'm going to respond in faith. To him. See, when Joshua eventually, 40 years later, after that generation dies away, 40 years later, Joshua arrives at the promised land. I mean, once again, too many stories to tell for one morning. But fact of the matter is that God parts the water of the Jordan, brings the people of Israel through, but they run into their greatest obstacle first. It's called the city of Jericho. Now, to give you an idea, the city of Jericho is, is such a great city that, that, that they've built a wall all around the city, which was the greatest sign of strength at that point in time of a city's defenses, is a physical wall around the city. But the city of Jericho had such a great wall that they had a road running on top of the wall around the city of Jericho. So just imagine a wall that is big enough for a road to run on top of the wall. That's what surrounds the city of Jericho. It's the first city that God expects Israel to take. I mean, talk about, this makes the 10 spies with a bad report look like nothing. This is a nation that doesn't own a single siege weapon, okay? So if, if you're into kind of medieval stuff, you've seen catapults and battering rams and, 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 and siege towers. They had none of that. They had soldiers with slingshots and uh, swords and stuff. And here's a city with a wall so great that they've got a road running on top of the wall. And, and, and it's, it's fascinating for me, but Joshua chapter 6, 
it is this moment where, where it must have been the moment where Joshua must have felt like the 10 spies. We don't have what it takes. He's looking at the city and he's going, we cannot. There's no military strategy that I can think of to do this. But look at what God tells him. It says, now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. Now, it's interesting that the people in Jericho knows the history of Israel better than what the Israel knows the history of Israel better, right? Because they're going, God has done all these great miracles for these guys and they've come to our city. None went out and none came in. The city's completely shut up. But then verse 2 comes along, and the Lord said to Joshua, see, oh, see. We'll speak about this next week. But if your eyes are good, your entire body's good. If you're able to see, if you're able to see, if you're able to see, see, I have given you Jericho into your hand. And it's interesting, Joshua doesn't reply and go, no, God, I don't see. I see walls. Because what? He's not building according to sight. He's not living according to sight. He's not, he didn't pack any fear. He, didn't, he packed what God told him to pack. He packed for 40 years. He packed a suitcase that said, God said we will take this land. God is able to do this. God is going to do this. God is going to give us this land. So he was all packed up. And inside his bag, he had no giving up. He had no turning around because he could see, I've given you the city into your hand, it's king and it's mighty men of valor. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, faith is the substance of things unseen. Faith is the ability to see something that cannot be seen. It's the ability to see what God sees. And when we respond in faith, we experience what God has in mind for our lives. God has greater dreams for you for the year ahead than what you could ever dream for yourself. God has bigger plans, and, and, I, and I'm not saying that we don't have to respond to God. Of course we've got to respond to God. Of course we've got to respond to what he's saying. Of course we've got to put, put our shoulders in behind it and, and do what we need to do. But the fact of the matter is, we cannot just live by sight. We've got to figure out what it is to live by faith. What is God's desire, God's plan for you for this year? God packed Israel a bag. It was several thousand years later when um, Jesus was on earth that he makes a reference back to this moment. So now you've got to remember for a couple thousand years, Israel's telling the story of how they plundered Egypt, Right? God plundered Egypt. They packed our bags. They gave us their gold. They gave us their silver. They set us up for this desire, this plan of God that he had in mind for us. Jesus comes along and he, he, he makes a statement when he sends out his disciples. And I'll close with this in Matthew chapter 10. Jesus calls his disciples and, and, and then he, he, he sends them out. And this is what he tells them. He says, provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor a bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs. For a worker is worthy of his food. It's interesting because Jesus actually says, don't pack. See, and, and his reference, he uses the same words Don't provide gold, nor silver, nor copper. Just like I provided thousands of years ago, and I packed them a bag, I want to pack you a bag. And then he challenges them and he says, go not with what you can gather, not with the hope you can muster up, not with the expectation of good that you can think up by yourself. It's going to be a good year. It's going to be a good year. It's going to be a good year. Not with the desperation of it. Better be a better year. Otherwise, I can't do it. He says, no, why, why don't you go? And as you go, you don't pack. Now, just that thought has got some of you very nervous. Some of you early packers. But he says this, he says, go, and as you go, 
Trust me. Believe me. Walk by faith, not by sight. It's about 20 verses later, and Jesus unpacks a whole bunch of stuff. And then he does tell them something to take along. It's in verse 38, and he says, He who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. It's interesting that Jesus' challenge to his disciples is to go, not carrying with them what they feel like they need, but to trust him that he will provide in every step of the journey. As he has before, he will do again. But he says, this one thing you need to take with you, it's you need to take your cross. And I know some of you are thinking about a little cross that you're going to hang around your neck, and you're going to say, oh, that's, that's I've got to take my cross. When you saw somebody walking with a cross in Jesus' day, it was somebody was walking the green mile. It was a dead man walking. You only took up a cross and walked if you were about to die. It was you were carrying your own instruments of execution to a bloody death if you were carrying a cross. So when Jesus said, pick up a cross and follow me, what he meant was lay down everything about yourself and pack this. Pack this life that is greater than you. Pack this moment that is bigger than your greatest comfort, bigger than your life lived for you and what you want. And just pack this one thing this year. Just take this with you. Take this along into this year. Take this moment with you and say, I'm not going to live for me. I'm going to pick up my cross. I'm going to I'm going to say that I'm with him. My life belongs to him, and I'm going to journey with him. Sacrifice everything. We all have some baggage. I, I brought my suitcase with a tag that I got from someone. It says, I come with baggage. We all come with baggage, don't we? We all come with hurt. We all come with disappointment. We all come with some expectations of the year before that didn't quite work out this time last year. You might have had some things that you were hoping this is going to happen and that's going to change and maybe it hasn't quite. I don't know what baggage you're bringing along, but I want to tell you there's an opportunity this morning to not only unpack your bag, but to pick up your cross and to say, I'm going to no longer live for these things. I'm going to allow God to deal with my past today and I'm going to allow God to pack me a bag. I'm going to trust God to, to take into 2020 those things which he has in mind for me, those things which he has prepared for me to take along. Let's pray. I don't know, Simon, if you can back me up here or Lauren, if you guys want to come up. But I want to make a moment this morning, and I, I, I felt this in the worship, and I, I want to be obedient for us to respond to God this morning. But I want to challenge you just to take a quiet moment before the God this morning. You can close your eyes. If you, if you struggle to focus with your eyes closed, you can keep them open. If you want to grab a hold of a notebook, you're welcome to do that. Whatever you need to do to focus. But I want to challenge you this morning to not just expect the service to be over, but to just for a moment incline your ear to God and say, God, would you come and speak to me? Would you come and pack a little bit of my bag for the year that lies ahead? Holy Spirit, would you come and whisper into every one of our ears some of your expectations? And I know this morning, I know there's some people that need to lay down some things that's baggage from the past. I know this morning that some of us just need to come and say, God, just because it was doesn't mean that it won't be. Just because it wasn't doesn't mean that it won't be. And you need to lay down some things from the past. And I know this morning some of us need to not only lay down things from the past, but 
maybe you're in a spot where you need to lay down some of the fear, and God's been speaking to us about fear this morning. Maybe there's some fears of 2020 you need to lay down. Some of us this morning need to lay down some things that you've been working really hard on. Some resolutions that you've set out. Some expectations of yourself that you've laid heavily on your own shoulders of how you're going to change things this year. And I need to come and challenge you this morning to not walk by sight or ability or your own strength, but to walk by faith. And as we lay down our bags, as we, as we open up our big black suitcases and we pack out our history and our expectations, I, I want to challenge you this morning to just turn your ears to God and say, God, would you pack me a bag? Would you come this morning in this quiet moment and in the, the quiet moments following this moment, would you come? You, would you come and give me a God-sized expectation? Would you come and change direction? Would you come and make me promises? Lord, even if those promises are that it's going to be tough, but you can help me through it, Lord, would you make me those promises? Would you speak into my heart for the time that lies ahead? Would you come and show me? Would you come and fill me with faith and and, and just the knowing that you're with me in every moment of this year, would you come and set me up with, with a prophetic expectation of what lies ahead? I, I see God stirring some people out of their comfort zones this morning. I see God challenging people. I see in the next week just the knowing that something that you haven't responded to that God's going to bring to your memory and you're going to start living it. It's going to be tough, but it's time to step out. We cannot settle for mediocrity. We cannot settle for mediocrity. You cannot simply go through the same motions again and again. I, I see God as God-sized, Jericho-sized challenges ahead of us. And may we respond and see that God has given us the city. May we respond to His voice. May we live by faith. May today be a day, be a moment in your journey where you decide to not just survive 2020. But may we start this year by picking up our cross and saying, God, this year, every breath that I breathe, every moment that I'm alive, all of my existence belongs to you. I'm taking up my cross. And I'm going to live this year not based on my expectations, but based on yours. In Jesus' name.